there is no more compelling story in the Old Testament than that of David, who rose from a simple shepherd boy to become the giant slayer, the poet laureate of Israel, and her greatest and most beloved king. The Old Testament devotes no less than 66 chapters to his story, more than to anyone else. And still today, the symbol of the Jewish faith is a six-pointed star, the Star of David. And there persisted among God's people a hope, an expectation across the centuries that one day Yahweh would anoint a king of kings, a Mashiach, in Greek a Christos, and he would be called the son of David. I'm Ken Durham. I teach in the Lipscomb University College of Bible and Ministry. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this new series of Bible studies we're calling David's Supporting Cast. We've invited eight gifted students of the Bible, eight women, to explore the wild and fascinating story of King David through the eyes of some of the main characters in his life, David's Supporting Cast. We think these studies will bless and challenge you to go deeper in your studies of the Word and will ultimately point you beyond a remarkable and very flawed person named David, to the person we believe to be the true King of Kings, God's Messiah, Jesus the Lord. Today we're joined by Mallory Wyckoff. And Mallory, welcome. We're so pleased that you could be part of this eight-part series of uh, some very gifted women who are uh, particularly strong in the Word of God. And so we look forward to what you have to say to us about Bathsheba today. But before you do, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, went to school, and, and what you're doing now. Sure. Uh, as you said, my name is Mallory. I grew up in Clearwater, Florida, mm -hmm. on the beaches there. Loved it. Still have that in my bones. Um, I came to Nashville about eight years ago for grad school. So I originally went to Lee University for undergrad and studied mm -hmm. journalism there, and then came over here to uh, do graduate work in theology at Lipscomb and enjoyed it so much so I decided to stick around for the DMIN uh, program here, which I finished in uh, April of this year. Congratulations. So recently, thank you. That. Yeah, yeah, it feels yeah. good to be done. Yeah. Um, I'm married to Tim, been married for almost eight years, and I am uh, about seven months pregnant with our first little one, oh. little girl. So Congratulations thank again. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. What kind of ministries are, are you involved in, you and Tim? Sure. So um, I'm, I'm in a transition period at this point. I just came out of five years of working with um, a residential facility that works with young women who have faced various forms of trauma and oftentimes sexually related trauma, so abuse, trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, and so we worked with them uh, as they brought various issues that had surfaced from that, that trauma, whether it was eating disorders, chemical dependency, whatever it may be. So I spent five years working with them, um, did my dissert dissertation work sort of out of that, that experience and in, in relation to it, and recently just transitioned out of that to start a spiritual direction practice. So I'm certified as a spiritual director and have begun meeting with people regularly and sitting with them and holding space for them and seeing what God is up to in their lives and, and in the world. So. Good for you. Thank you. Good for you. I think your topic today is Bathsheba, the silent story. So I'm very intrigued, uh, yes. as I think we all are, to hear what you will bring to us from the life of David and Bathsheba today. Yes. Okay. Hear now the word of the Lord from 2 Samuel 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. 
the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked Joab, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him with a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you've just come from a journey. Why do you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in an open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so he may be struck down and die. As Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew they were valiant warriors. The men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, when you finish telling the king all the news about the fighting, then if the king's anger rises and if he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Bimelech, son of Jeroboam? Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at the Bez? Why did you go so near to the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead too. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, thus you shall say to Joab, don't let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours one and then another. Press your attack on the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent her and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, I found myself in a dark movie theater in Montgomery, Alabama, watching the film Selma in the middle of a week-long civil rights pilgrimage. Selma was only 50 miles from where I sat, a site memorialized in the Civil Rights March of 1965. Having just stood on the Capitol steps where I now saw a fictional king deliver his rousing address, having just toured a museum in Birmingham displaying the most heinous acts of white supremacy, having spent many months reading through jarring accounts of life in Jim Crow South, I felt many things. I felt proud of the courage and tenacity of human beings in the face of evil. I felt inspired to further my efforts towards racial justice and reconciliation. I felt despair at the ever wide chasm between how far we have come and how very much is yet to be done. And I also felt something I did not expect and knew even less of what to do with. I felt conflicted. Here I watched a story about a man whose work I admire so deeply, whose legacy persists in inestimable ways, a man who championed justice through nonviolent means, a man who slept with prostitutes and wasn't faithful to his wife. 
Though it seems history may never deliver an altogether clear and certain picture of King's sexual exploits, what is clear is that when I'm reminded of this disconnect between King's calls for justice for blacks on the one hand and exploitation of women on the other, when I speak of it even now, I feel an ache in the deepest part of me. It's not that I've ever needed champions of justice to be perfect, to be more than human. It's that I struggle to reconcile my thoughts towards King as both a hero and a womanizer. What do I do with a man who on the one hand called for us to imagine and live into God's beloved community, and on the other hand perpetuated injustice against vulnerable women? I don't know. And it seems my only option, so long as I live in the world in which I find myself, is to face head on such discrepancies, such lapses in our pursuit of God's kingdom, such disconnects between the community we're called into and the one in which we reside. This scenario is not altogether different from the one we encounter in 2 Samuel 11, the story of David and Bathsheba. As far as I can tell, Commentators throughout history have felt a similar discomfort with the notion of King David as a man who fails so deeply. This discomfort, coupled with centuries of systemic sexism, has led to countless interpretations of the text which paint Bathsheba as a seductress, a wanton woman bathing boldly in the open, hoping to catch the king's eye with robust thighs and sultry lips and secure an invitation to his bedroom. Throughout the years, artists of various stripes have perpetuated this image, from films like the 1951 Gregory Peck classic to Renaissance oil paintings. In each portrayal, Bathsheba's body, her femininity, her personhood are dangerous. What's poor David to do with a temptress eager to lure her way into his bedroom? Commentators and preachers often have echoed a similar sentiment, noting that if David had simply been at war among his fellow kings, as was the custom in springtime, he would have remained in God's will, tucked away, safe from temptation. In recent years, many feminist interpreters have rightly sounded a rebuttal against such readings, changing Bathsheba from a seductive instigator to a victim of rape. The story is not about a king committing adultery. The story is about the sexual exploitation of a woman. Previously assigned the role of temptress, Bathsheba now bears the role of victim. And while I am perpetually grateful for these dissenting voices adding much needed perspective to what previously was a one-sided patriarchal message, I just have to wonder if we can be so certain of what Bathsheba felt when she received the summons from the king's messengers. For so long, we were told she deemed it as success, the culmination of her careful plan, and now we're told she likely felt horrified, stunned, and without options. But if Bathsheba is anything like the countless women I've come across over the last five years of ministry, women who themselves have been victims of heinous sexual abuse and trafficking, it seems likely that perhaps her feelings were more complex and complicated than we can even imagine. I wonder, what was it like for her to find the king's men at her door, to hear their command to leave her home at once and meet David in his palace? Perhaps she felt angry at being the victim of voyeurism scared at the sight of the swords on the messenger's hips, uncomfortable with their hands on her shoulders, curious to meet the king and glimpse the interior of the palace, hopeful that he was indeed the godly man they said he was, flattered that he found her beautiful, lonely from her husband's long absence, confused as to what would unfold. Maybe she felt like I do in so many public settings, never wanting to assume the worst in every man who looks my way and so smiling politely, and yet sometimes finding their responses revolting and degrading. Maybe she held hope even as she felt held fear. 
And what did she feel when she found out the king's true purpose in summoning her, knowing the discrepancy in their positions of power meant her inevitable rape? Had she been in a position like this before as a child in Jerusalem, uncomfortable at her neighbor's gaze and nauseated by his wandering hands? Had she come to expect such inevitable vulnerability as a female as so many women feel today? Or did she feel like fighting tooth and nail to protect herself and her dignity? I wonder what questions floated through her mind. Could I have done something differently? Should I have bathed at another time? Did I do something to incite this? Is my body dangerous? Perhaps she felt as conflicted as my friend Emily, a young woman who survived decades of the most brutal sex trafficking ring imaginable, a ring devised and managed by her own father. He was a powerful political figure in her town, publicly holding power and position, and privately holding dozens of women and children captive. Emily does not wax romantic about her time in slavery, about the daily torture and abuse and humiliation. But on occasion, with tears in her eyes, she mentions that despite the role her father played in her captivity, she still desires for him to be a dad. She longs for the affection that she never received from him. She wishes she could know him in a different way. These thoughts confuse her. She doesn't understand how she could feel any desire for connection with her chief abuser, but she does. I've heard countless stories from other women who've been victimized in horrifying ways, molested by their uncles, harassed by peers, forced to bear family secrets. And in each case, they bear more than the wounds of their trauma. They hold questions about themselves about their potential complicity in their abuse, about their responses. They ask, did I do something to invite this? Does my voice not hold weight? Why did my body respond the way that it did? Am I dirty? Should I forgive my abuser and move on? Am I making this up in my mind? Can I ever feel normal again? There's no end to the mental torment that so many abuse survivors endure, the complex and conflicting questions and doubts that arise. I imagine that Bathsheba felt all of this and more. But the story doesn't tell us what she felt. In a story with David at the center, we're told only a few details about Bathsheba, who her body belonged to as the former property of her father and now her husband, what was done to her body by the king, and of the ill child her body produced in the aftermath of her abuse. We don't get to know for sure what thoughts filled her mind, what questions plagued her heart. And so instead, I propose that we direct the questions towards ourselves, the body of Christ. I suggest that we ask ourselves the questions that surface from a story like this, a story that in reality plays out each and every day among us. Let us start at the beginning. We're told that in the springtime the kings went out to war, but David stayed home while her, his soldiers, quote, ravaged enemy armies. Rather than an indictment of David's placement, a recipe to be where you're supposed to be and thus avoid temptation, I'm convinced that a culture of violence and bloodshed provides the very context for this story. If it was so ingrained in their cultural identity to murder and slaughter others, why are we surprised that David would murder Uriah? What about our own culture has normalized violence that necessarily normalizes the abuse of the vulnerable? In what ways are we accustomed to a calendar punctuated by war and death and destruction? and who is suffering because of it. When David is told of Uriah's death, he responds casually that war is war and people will die. Have we as the people of God adopted a similar mindset, coolly responding to what we've come to believe is the inevitable? We know that David's children received the inheritance of violence and exploitative actions, for in two chapters over, 
We're told of how his son rapes his own sister, how another son murders his brother for revenge, how the victim is told to keep quiet and mourn silently over her rape. What legacy are we shaping for our children? Are they inheriting a church in which violence, retribution, rape, and abuse become the food they ingest and the bodies they grow? Where have we allowed such a culture to influence the ways we treat one another, the ways we teach our children? And let us return to Bathsheba, the first victim in this tragic tale. I wonder what story shaped David's personhood, where he chose to reject the creation narratives that conveyed his being made in the image of God, the same image in which Bathsheba and all other women are formed. What narrative silenced such notions of equality and dignity and humanity and instead communicated his ability to conquer whatever and whomever he desired? As the people of God, what stories are we being formed in? Do we root ourselves in the nature of a triune God in whom exists perfect communal equality and mutuality? Or do we worship other gods that tell us that some bodies are inherently more valuable than other bodies? Do our structures and practices and teachings call us into greater experiences of love and care for one another? Or do they quietly but effectively raise up little Davids who prey on the bodies of Bathsheba's? Does our handling of abuse within our communities sound like an attorney's justification of his client's swimming record and good grades? Or do we weep and wail and rend our garments for the ways the world is not yet as it should be, redoubling our efforts to participate in the world as it will be? When the Bathsheba's among us, bruised and broken by the hands of David, bring their questions and confusion how do we respond? Are our church bodies safe places for the wounded to heal, or do we merely heap shame and add wounds? Questions like these are difficult to face, and it's difficult to consider how heroes among us can act in such heinous ways. It's troubling to think of the beloved Martin Luther King Jr., the one who rallied so many for justice as the one who exploited women. It's difficult to reconcile the quote, man after God's own heart with a story that so clearly identifies him as a rapist and a murderer. But this difficulty we face in making sense of reality necessarily points us beyond the individual to the culture, the society, the systems that contributed to such injustice that led men to believe their basest desires deserved to be met, that women's bodies were theirs for the taking, that power should be used to serve self. As the Bathshebas among us are haunted by questions surrounding their abuse, are we willing to face the questions that must be asked? Are we willing to dismantle every structure that props up injustice and inequality and pursue the kingdom of God wherein Bathshebas are healed, Davids are forgiven, and we can live into God's beloved community that Dr. King preached about? Gracious God, grant that it may be so among us. We are back with Mallory Wyckoff. Mallory, um, that was disturbing hmm. to me that picture that you painted. Um, and I'm gonna be thinking and maybe grieving over that picture for a while. I think, uh, what was your phrase? This is a time that we, uh, we look at a picture in God's word and we are called to weep, wail, and rend our garments. Because these are truths that are inescapable about that which is not of the kingdom of God. So thank you for taking us to a very dark place where people of conscience and people of, uh, of, of kingdom character must go uh, and, and find the strength and the, the wherewithal from God to, to address culture, cultures of violence, cultures of war, mm. cultures of the demeaning uh, and the subjugation of women and the poor and, mm -hmm. and, and other persons of lesser value sure. in our eyes, in our society. So I wanna, I wanna thank you for that. I wonder, 
you are a person who now spends a lot of your time and your ministry in helping in the spiritual formation mm -hmm. of men and women. And so I wonder if, if you would uh, talk a minute about how spiritual formation, the spiritual disciplines, the ways that we grow in Christ and grow in our relationship with God can both transform us and through us transform a culture that is much too familiar with and comfortable with the kinds of, of evils that, mm. that you identified in that story. Sure. The first thought that comes to mind is wanting to resurrect a holistic sense of spiritual formation, so not one that is divorced from embodied reality, embodied, embodied existence. Um, for so long, I think, spirituality was considered separate from mm. the corporal reality of, of life and pursued in that way, and it's just not possible, and it's so damaging to us. We are, we are holistic beings. And so I think it's so important to help folks consider how um, what it means to be an embodied human being and what are they embodying in their humanity? Is it that of the kingdom? Okay, is it that you, of... Would you talk a little bit about an embodied human being? Sure. Help, help me understand that phrase. Sure. Um, connecting all of the parts of ourselves and not considering okay. spirituality as something other than or greater than um, our, our physical selves, okay. our bodies. I talk a lot about bodies in this, this sermon for a reason. Uh, because one, the, the story just provides it there, um, but helping folks even consider what does it look like to uh, to see basic realities of embodied existence, um, cooking, running, making love, anything as a spiritual act. What does it look like to mm -hmm. invite God into that space mm -hmm. and to see the spirit of God at work? Um, so helping to break down some of those really false sort of dualisms and, and instead pursuing a more holistic sense. Because I think that not only forms us as individuals, but it forms our community. It helps us see, okay, where, where have we put blinders up? Where have we said these things are separate or these things don't interact? But instead seeing, no, they're all part of yeah. the same story. Yeah. So. I wonder, um, is, is it in 1 Corinthians 6? I don't remember correctly that Paul says, you are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me Paul is suggesting this kind of holistic theology of the body. When we give ourselves to God, we give our whole selves to God and we are accountable for what we do in the flesh, mm -hmm. in the spirit, in, in every act of, of being sure. in his creation. So I wonder if if that doesn't uh, speak to, to some of the some of the disturbing things that were going on in, in the David story, which is full of physicality, yes. right? You've got the violence of war, you've got the violence against this woman. I, one thing you said, I have to uh, just call to mind, because uh, it's one of the things that troubled me and I hope awakened to me, is that, it's, that Bathsheba may have gone to the palace hoping David was the righteous man that he was famously known to be, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, he clearly did not live up to mm -hmm. his reputation that day as a man after God's own heart. But she may yes. have gone in trust, mm -hmm. um, but that trust was violated. Um, yes. So what would you say to some of our viewers who, who want to use their life of prayer or scripture or, or just in service to, to become more to become smarter about what's going on in the world and find ways as a Christian to respond in a, in a, in a positive way or in a, in a constructive way? Uh, are, there, are there ministries, are there opportunities here in Nashville for people who, who want to get involved in, in, uh, in speaking to these kind of crimes against mm -hmm. human beings? Sure, so there's a lot there. My first thought is that what we, I think we, each of us has to do is to um, become connected with our own brokenness first, whether that means ways that we've been wounded or ways that we have caused um, wounding in others, and, and often it's both. And to be honest about that, to not segment that from our conscious, but to bring that 
to the table and to name it and to address it because so many folks are desperate to do that but don't often find spaces to be able to, to name those realities. And so I think we have to be committed to doing that, to again identifying our own brokenness before we can ever begin to approach or try to help redeem that of others. Okay. Um, and then as we do that, I think we become, as now and would say, wounded healers where we are then creating a space that invites others to do that, where we can, um, we, we can confidently and humbly name that we're very broken and that our bodies have been broken and as a body of Christ, we are broken and yet the body of Christ was broken for us to bring healing and redemption and freedom. Um, and so to name that reality just as, just as truly is, is significantly important. Um, and com being committed to do that together um, communally as well as individually, I think it shapes us to be ones who then can see, okay, where are the needs outside of our own uh, church body, what is going on within our community, because it certainly exists there, but also externally. Where can we put our hands to this good work? Because all that we need uh, for motivation for that good work is found in the kingdom. It's there, and there's a far better narrative told in the kingdom of God than there is outside of that. And so if we're fully rooted into that, I think it necessarily will um, issue in really important redemptive work that's so needed. Okay. Mallory, thank you mm -hmm. for... Uh, pricking our consciences today as I think the story of David was meant mm. to do. I think uh, we've, we've been made even more deeply aware why this is part of the story of Jesus, that even this man who is something of a, of a precursor or a, uh, a typology of Messiah uh, could be so brought down by his own sin, mm. his own selfishness, his own pride and privilege but could also turn to God as in Psalm 51 and, and say, create in me a clean heart, mm -hmm. O Lord. And I hope we can assume that was his true prayer and, and that's where we see the man after God's own mm -hmm. heart. Thank you, yes, Mallory, thank for you. what you brought to us today. Thank you.